And when I was looking at my, my task, I was like, well, I can talk about immigrant labor in slaughterhouses, or I can talk about immigrant labor in the dairy industry. And given that um, for a couple hundred pages on dairy, that's what I'm going to focus most of my discussion on. Um, I'm really excited to uh, hear people's thoughts on the book um, over the next couple of days. So, um, so farm workers from Latin America have come to play a really central role in the U.S. dairy industry. And uh, um, over the last three decades, uh, farm workers have moved to the picturesque rural countrysides of New England, drawn to the promise of year-round work that dairy promises. For some, the northern states of New England are just the most recent stop in a long line of more impermanent and unstable employment in the U.S. food system, especially uh, older individuals. Um, for others, family networks have brought them directly to the rolling green hills and the milking barns from their homes and fields in Mexico and Central America. And my own work, both academic and applied, has centered in the work of Vermont, which is really widely seen as an agrarian utopia where socially responsible brands like Ben and & Jerry's and Cabot have flourished. It's a place where the local food movement has taken firm hold of the consumer imaginary and purchasing power. Um, and this is really well detailed in some of the work um, that Suzanne was talking about, specifically the work of Heather Paxson. Um, within this imagined agrarian utopia, migrant workers labor and live in the state's shadow economy to sustain industrialized food production while experiencing everyday discrimination and difficulty accessing their most basic needs. And my work really specifically looks at food access, which hopefully I'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about. So within the landscapes where dairy farms persist, even as they struggle to profit, Hegemonic whiteness, or more specifically, the reproduction of whiteness, is enabled by the exclusion and marginalization of non-white bodies. And in his now classic examination of uh, California's labor camps, Don Mitchell, our illustrious moderator, um, characterizes this as the social and spatial relations of agricultural labor production that perpetuate and normalize geography of farm labor invisibility. For farm workers in the dairy industry, the milking barn is often an extension of their home, a place where they remain out of sight and therefore as safe as possible in this often unforgiving landscape. And their invisibility and the continued labor are critical for the continued operation of the dairy farm. And because of this, the fear of border patrol is often shared by farm owners and managers. Latino dairy workers experience a great deal of fear, isolation, and anxiety in their daily lives as invisible workers in what Susanna McCandless, a colleague of mine, has called a carceral landscape. And for many workers, particularly those in the northern borderlands, the line surrounding the farm becomes the most proximate border that they have to decide whether they can cross or not. And this is a life that people often describe as being in uh, being penned in or being enclosed. So the invisibility of immigrant workers has material consequences, both for themselves and for the eventual consumers. Um, and hiding the bodies and suffering of food workers is symbiotic with what Jero has termed the biopolitics of disposability, really thinking about whose bodies matter, whose bodies don't. And as Sidney Mintz, my, my sort of hero anthropologist, argued decades ago, the exploitation and the invisibility of workers is not external to food production, but really a precondition of it. So the dairy industry as it stands depends on immigrant labor. Um, the figures captured here provide either a snapshot of that dependence, and less straightforward, though, are the political economic changes that have led to this dependence. The first two figures being by the uh, National Milk Producers Federation, which is um, interesting in terms of its uh, uh, data and data collection. So while much has been said about the dumping of U.S. corn on the Mexican market and consequent immigration, uh, less attention has been paid to the political economic histories and the transnational impacts of the deregulation of Mexico's dairy industry amidst the growing consolidation and industrialization of our own. And as with corn production, these neoliberal reforms were facilitated by NAFTA, which is an agreement that flooded Mexico with U.S. subsidized milk as well as U.S. subsidized corn. And as with corn, small-scale dairy farmers on both sides of the border, as well as our border with Canada, have endured assaults to their livelihood and market volatility because of these reforms. Interestingly, the U.S. Dairy Export Council was really central in lobbying for some of these policies, and these dairy giants that make up that council are now benefiting from the labor that has been displaced from Latin America. We're in a moment where we're talking about renegotiation of NAFTA, and a whole new sort of flurry of attention is paid to what this might mean. And milk, I think, is going to become this really um, hot button point for some of those potential renegotiations. So like, like most agricultural sectors across the nation, dairy has uh, grown increasingly industrialized since the 
1950s. Vermont currently has about 725 dairies as of um, earlier this year in a state that used to have 11,000 in the 1940s, but we're producing more milk with those fewer <coughs> farms. So this industrialization has resulted in consolidation of thousands of small family farms into a much smaller number of large farms with larger herds and more intensive milking schedules. And the technologies and labor practices associated with milking have also become um, shifted to become more uniform, mechanized, and less amenable to small-scale farming. This has everything to do with um, what size of driveways you must have for the milk truck to what size of milk, milk tank you must have. Um, and farmers must often make this really difficult choice of hiring immigrant workers or going under. So there's a serious concern about who will fill these positions in our food system. Should there be the promised ramping up of border enforcement and an increase in the de deportations of the bad hombres that are said to be invading our country? And in a time of increased hysteria about our borders, what this anti-immigrant rhetoric fails to account for is how dependent our food security, our own food security, is on immigrant workers and these really complex political economic histories that have left millions of people in Latin America with limited livelihood options for them. We're only fed because of the labor of individuals who are possessed in their home countries, only to face further challenges working in the U.S. food system. So you've seen this map before. I think Don and Matt and I probably sleep with this printed underneath our, our pillows. Um, so the majority of Vermont, um, New Hampshire, New York, which are all really important dairy producing states, falls within the 100-mile border where immigration and customs and enforcement officers have the authority to stop and search travelers without reasonable suspicion or a warrant. And today we're in that 100-mile border zone, and I think that's an important sort of geophysical discussion that we must have. So the hypervisibility and assumed undocumented status of Latino workers in this area puts them at risk for compounding experiences of structural vulnerability and irregular and inadequate access to basic needs as well as social connection. And the closer you move to the border, these anxieties tend to, tend to intensify um, as we see greater numbers of Border Patrol and ICE um, patrol agents in that sort of very northernmost band of 25 miles. So for farm workers in New England that are living in rural areas, especially those uh, near the border, a trip to the grocery store, or to go to the doctor, or to go to church is a source for significant worry and fear. And this freedom that many of us take for granted which is you know, going by that convenience store for a gallon of milk on the way home, or picking up our children, or going to soccer games, is denied to those individuals who are working in these landscapes. So not all is sort of um, doom and gloom. Okay? There's this other side to this uh, moment, and another side to this politics of this community. So since 2009, the living and working conditions of Latino workers, specifically in Vermont's dairy industry, but also broader industry, have become more visible to the broader public. And this increased visibility has followed a number of important high-profile events and farm worker-led organizing for food justice that have really challenged the erasure of Latino farm workers from our conversations around food systems. As migrant justice has worked tirelessly to create spaces and channels for farm workers to share their experiences and raise the collective consciousness of us all, the organization has been really central to changing the public conversation about farm workers in Vermont. So um, this picture shows a particularly momentous day in early October of 2017. And this is Church Street, one of Burlington's sort of iconic places in front of an iconic place on Church Street, which has been in Jerry's flagship store. And in early October of 2017, the CEO of Vermont's best love company, perhaps, Ben and Jerry's, and farm workers from Mexico signed the groundbreaking Milk with Dignity Agreement. Young men and women from Chiapas and Tabasco and other southern and central Mexican states shared the microphone with CEO Josephine Solheim, who expressed their excitement about the future of the Milk with Dignity program and reflected on the really long years of campaigning that brought them to that day. And this sharing of the microphone, I'm, a, I'm an anthropologist, I love symbols. Um, this sharing of the microphone represented a sharing of power that is uncommon in most corporate food production. And the agreement that was finally signed on this warm autumn morning would not have been possible without the leadership of farm workers. We're going to hear about that today as well as the support of their allies. Importantly, this is based on a model of worker-driven social responsibility, which is designed to guarantee equitable working and living conditions on the dairy farms that provide companies like Ben & Jerry's with their milk. It's also designed to provide a premium to the farmers who are following that code of conduct. Drawing inspiration from the Coalition of Immokalee Workers and their successful Fair Food Program, 
Milk with Dignity aims to highlight the needs and priorities of those who typically remain voiceless in the complex supply chains of our industrial food system, which is those immigrant workers who are on the ground. So Milk with Dignity shows a very healthy distrust for corporate behavior, as well as a healthy distrust for state-based enforcement, and centers the knowledge of workers who are in the best position to speak about workplace conditions. And to me, workplace, uh, work, worker driven social responsibility represents this really compelling possibility for rendering visible and eliminating the human rights abuses that persist in the supply chains that deliver the goods that we've all come to expect, whether it's strawberries in winter or whether it's milk year round. So, whether it's Ben and Jerry's ice cream, tomatoes on our hamburgers, or the clothing that we wear, worker driven social responsibility demands that we, as informed consumers, have a really critical role in supporting workers. I'm not going to make the assumption that we're only consumers, as we've seen in the great lineup so far today. So while we consider the potential future of a food system that's based on principles of dignity, human rights, and sustainability, we have to remember that farm workers are more than workers, even as their lives are often governed by the work that they do. Their worth is more than the economic contributions that they bring to the food industry. They're members of loving families with enduring ties to their home communities in Latin America and to those who remain there. Um, as I've seen, they're fierce and resilient activists who demand dignity and fairness in their workplace. They're mothers and fathers who, through their labor, are trying to provide greater opportunities for their children. They're not criminalized, even at, or they're not criminals, even as they are criminalized. They're not bringing problems, but rather sustaining our food system. And they're not coming from the quote unquote shithole countries, but rather have made the really difficult decision to leave places that have experienced long histories of dispossession, colonization. and so forth. 
Uh, and I thought I would start by uh, asking uh, Will Gladstone, as a farmer, have you read about what, 1,400 cows? Is that, is that right? Higher maybe 15? 14. Four, 14 people, right? Um, as far as people? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, well. <laughs> Well then, why, why, why let me summarize what you do? Why don't sure, you tell course. us what you do and tell us what the challenges you confront by way of labor are, yeah, what sure. it feels like. Yep, so um, me and my dad are here today. Um, me and my, my parents uh, and my younger brother um, farm together in Fairley, um, Vermont. We, my parents bought the farm in 1988 and it was a uh, smaller dairy than it is today. Um, started milking cows um, in 1988 and um, over time grew, grew the business um, to where it is today. Um, we currently have uh, 16 people that work for us from Mexico um, and yeah, so we, it's, it's paramount that we, we have these people work for us, um, obviously the, the local community um, for us, the employment rate is, is quite low, and um, it's it's very hard to find local local help. Um, we do have eight or nine local folks that work for us, um, and and like I said, it's it's grown over time to what it is today. Um, so we did, we didn't always have sixteen folks that work for us from Mexico, but that that has grown over time to what it is today. Um, so, you know, it, for us, it's, it's a way of life. Um, we love what we do. Um, we, and, and these folks come to us and, and they really become part of our family, I would almost say. Um, we have personal, you know, personal relationships with, with most all of them um, that have been working for us for any length of time, really. Just like whether it was American, Mexican, Guatemalan, it, it really doesn't matter to us. Um, we just want to have good help to help us get done what we need to get done. And um, so, I don't know if you want to leave well, with some questions. Sure. Or, let me let me ask you one, just to be a little bit provocative. Sure. Um, Teresa used the term, and it's it's central to what migrant justice does, of worker-driven social responsibility. And when you hear that term as, as a farmer and as an employer, is it, um, is it something you welcome? Is it something that you, you're leery of? Is it something that doesn't matter? Or How do you just, I guess you'd have to describe that a little bit more to me for me to understand what that, what you're driving at. Hola a todos, eh, mi nombre es Enrique Valcaza, eh, soy parte de la comunidad migrante en el estado de Vermont. My name is Will Landbeck, I'll be interpreting for Kike. Uh, Kike says, hello everybody, my name is Enrique Valcaza, uh, I'm from Migrant Justice in Vermont. Sí, bueno, en Vermont eh, nosotros igual, como eh, mostraba la explicación de Teresa, eh, habemos Eh, un montón ¿verdad? De, de trabajadores migrantes ayudando a sostener esta industria, ayudando a sobrevivir a los ranchos, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, nosotros eh, hemos visto ¿verdad? que hay ranchos donde los trabajadores no son tratados bien, donde no se cumple ni el salario mínimo, diferentes condiciones. Entonces, condiciones de vivienda igual eh, malas en, en varios ranchos. Entonces, todo esto nos ha llevado a, a, a buscar una solución, ¿verdad? Una solución más grande que ir cambiando rancho por rancho. Y es ahí donde entra el modelo de WSR, eh, un modelo de Workers Driven Social Responsibility que viene de la Florida, de la coalición de trabajadores de Mocali, eh, del tomate, que hace este modelo realmente los trabajadores, uh, so as, as Teresa said, um, uh, in, in Vermont, where, where we come from, uh, there's a, a large group of workers who are helping to sustain the dairy industry uh, to keep farms afloat. Um, uh, and on many farms uh, uh, where we have experience, uh, workers are, are not treated well. 
they suffer from poor labor conditions and bad housing as well when we live on the farm. Um, so this compelled us to search for a solution uh, and to look for uh, a large scale solution that wasn't trying to address these issues farm by farm, uh, but looking to address them at a larger scale. Uh, and that's what led us to this model of WSR, or Worker Driven Social Responsibility. This is a model that was pioneered by a group called the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, or the CIW, from Florida. Entonces, el modelo eh, es, ¿verdad? Los trabajadores son los arquitectos de, de, sus pro, de definir qué realmente es un trabajo justo, ¿verdad? Porque son los que están día a día ahí eh, y muchas veces aceptando estas condiciones, viviendo estas condiciones. Entonces, definen qué es justo eh, y, y también el, como eso es la cosa del programa, en vez de que las corporaciones... Eh, que siempre se hacen ricas de todo este trabajo y, y muchas veces de la explotación, definan qué es justo para nosotros. Entonces, eh, nosotros hemos tomado el paso para cambiar ese modelo y que los trabajadores tengan una voz para definir qué realmente es justo. Eh, y también aquí meto eh, que, bueno, las corporaciones más grandes, ¿verdad? No los ranchos, sino las corporaciones que se hacen ricas, ese modelo de las compañías definen qué es responsabilidad social, corporaciones definiendo qué es responsabilidad social, eso lo usan en algunas ocasiones para eh, tapar las condiciones que pasan o de dónde están comprando sus productos o de dónde está viniendo todas eh, su, sus cosas que necesitan. And so worker, th this model is based on the concept that workers should be the architects of, of defining uh, what is fair uh, and, and what are just conditions uh, because we're the ones who are living uh, in these conditions day to day we're experiencing it uh, in our lived experience um, and, and so it puts on it, it turns on its head this idea of uh, corporations uh, defining that uh, because these corporations are the ones who uh, have been getting rich off of our work and off of our exploitation um, so it changes uh, this model to insert the worker voice and worker power. Um, that's what it's about. Uh, and I want to emphasize here, we're talking about companies, large companies, that are at the top of the supply chain, uh, not the farm employers themselves. Um, but this uh, traditional idea of corporate social responsibility, or CSR, is more often than not used to actually cover up uh, the conditions as they exist. Um, and uh, uh, I, get, I guess yeah, I, guess, uh, yeah, I got a question to that. So, when you, when you say the corporate side, um, most, most of these dairy workers are not working for corporations. I mean, 99% of, fair, of farms in the United States are owned by, by families. They're family-owned businesses. So I guess I'm trying to understand where, where this corporate side comes in. And, and, and I guess I would speak to the living conditions there's only 725 of us left in the state. Most of us all know each other. And, um, you know, we would have tremendous turnover, and that is not our goal. We want to have people, we always say this when a new employee comes, they come to work, we say, when you leave, we want you to leave to go back home. We don't want you to leave because our conditions are poor or because you feel like you weren't valued or you were underpaid. We want people to stay for three, four, five years. We've got numerous employees that have worked for us for between three and 10 years. A few guys have worked for us as long as 12 years without going home. Um, so I guess that's my question. I, I don't understand where this the, the corporate side comes in as far as the wealth because as, as as it was mentioned earlier, at one point there was 11,000 of us in the state. There's only 725 of us left. We're not making money doing this. Sí, eh, bueno, mi experiencia eh, y nosotros los trabajadores hemos siempre estamos analizando, verdad, la, la industria eh, de la lechería. Entonces, en Vermont, por ejemplo, Ben and Jerry's. Eh, compra de la cooperativa Senalvans, eh, que es una de las que tiene de 300 a 400 ranchos del estado de Vermont. 
Entonces, eh, y estas compañías compran de esa cooperativa, por ejemplo, Ben Jerry's es, es un ejemplo, Cabo Cheese es otro ejemplo donde eh, este compra y en su sitio web dice eh, de 1200 ranchos eh, de estados de Nueva Inglaterra, Nueva York, eh, Vermont eh, y otro Pensilvania y otros estados. Entonces, eh, si sí hay corporaciones eh, que, que realmente se pues, están haciendo ricas de esto y realmente el modelo pues, hace que estas compañías realmente tomen responsabilidad por lo que está pasando, ¿verdad? Eh, entonces, el modelo es definido por los trabajadores, las compañías se comprometen a firmarlo y aparte dan un incentivo a los rancheros, un incentivo económico para que puedan lograr eh, las demandas que están haciendo los, los trabajadores y esa es parte del modelo, es uno de los puntos, no viene eh, de, de la bolsa del ranchero. Entonces, esto es una parte importante que toma en cuenta las necesidades actuales eh, en la industria lechera. So, in, in my experience, in, in our organizational experience, uh, and we embarked on this by starting by analyzing the dairy industry and understanding how supply chains work. Uh, so in Vermont, for example, uh, we have the company Ben & Jerry's, which you heard about, which buys from uh, the cooperative St. Albans, uh, which has around three or four hundred uh, farms in, uh, in that co-op, and, and farms out of the co-op, and companies buy from them, and, and Cabot is another company uh, and another co-op that, if you go on their website, you see that they're supplying from around 1,200 farms around New England, New York, and perhaps Pennsylvania. Um, but uh, when we talk about corporations, it's about the corporations at the top of the supply chain taking responsibility for the conditions throughout that supply chain, for the, the conditions of, of workers in that supply chain. Um, and by taking responsibility, uh, it's uh, a price tag. So companies uh, are, are expected to pay a premium uh, in order to allow farmers to make the changes that are being demanded by workers. Uh, so it's not coming from farmers' pockets themselves, uh, but by the companies at the top of the supply chain uh, who are making profits. So that's that's the key point then, that uh, in order for it to be um, profitable to the farmer and for workers to work and live with the dignity they deserve, there has to be changes at the top that affect the way that the market for milk, for example, operates. I, I guess the part that I'd speak to that I go back to um, you know, I can't speak for everyone else, but I can tell you our farm and all of our neighbors and associates that we know, we would not treat people poorly or have them in poor living conditions because they wouldn't stay working for us. I mean, why would they? They have the free will to go wherever they want to. The beauty is nowadays, everyone has access to a phone and Facebook that these folks know what people are paying in California, Michigan, um, New York State has raised their minimum wage, so we've had to become more competitive in Vermont as far as, as our wages go. Um, again, going back to the corporate wealth, um, Agamart, like you said, Cabot, that's member owned. So um, there's the, whatever profits there are left at the end of the year come back to the farmers. This year there was no profit sharing, none. And we had an equity deduct all year long, so I, I guess I'm not seeing where where the money is coming from because, like with Cabot, who we sell our milk to, um, yeah, no, it's 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 very much a global market. Um, 16 to 17 percent of all of our milk in this country. So one day a week, can you imagine it? One day a week, all of the milk in this whole country leaves the country. And what's happened is, is our export markets have eroded based on the current political situation. That's no surprise. So um, I guess where I'm going with it is, is I, I can totally see having a fair and just system to pay these guys. These guys have a long, hard road. I mean, it, if in our eyes, they're the cream of the crop. I mean, they're the guys that came thousands of miles away to support whoever it was that stayed back at home, God bless them, to come up here and work and make their lives better. Um, 
you know, I, I, I'm sure that maybe there's a handful of farms out there that the living conditions might be poor, but, but I don't see it as a farm. We, so we don't see it. We have three, we have three brand new or fairly new remodeled houses and, um, you know, they, they have all the access to any amenities that, that we would have. They can go to Hannaford's. We have a, we have a gentleman that they can call any day of the week and, and get a ride to the store on us. Um, so I, I'm not seeing this, this denial to food or, or any access or the wages for them to better their lives. Most of these guys have built new houses, have done really awesome things back home. And uh, so that's, so, so that's, you're, that's you're what raising, I see. I don't see this big glaring problem. You, you've raised about, uh, I don't know, a dozen really important issues here. And we'll try and get to as many of them as, as we can. Um, TK, do you want to, did you want to jump back in first? And then I want to go to Doug after this. Sí, bueno, eh, nosotros en, en el 2014 hicimos una encuesta eh, de trabajador a trabajador. Yo he sido trabajador en cuatro ranchos diferentes en el estado de Vermont. Entonces he tenido la experiencia de trabajar en ranchos donde las condiciones son mejores, a, a, como la que está explicando, y hay ranchos donde eh, las condiciones son eh, malas, donde no tenía día de descanso, ganaba como 4 dólares por hora, eso estoy hablando del 2011. Nosotros eh, lanzamos una encuesta eh, y fuimos rancho por rancho. Y logramos hacer casi 200 a diferentes trabajadores de diferentes ranchos en las cuales, por ejemplo, aprendimos que los trabajadores trabajan 60, 80 horas a la semana. Eh, 40% de esos encuestados no reciben el salario perdón, eh, mínimo del Estado. Eh, eh, 40% no tenía día de descanso. Entonces, y nuestra encuesta pues, está publicada en el sitio web de Migrant Justice. Y, y a eso es lo que yo voy. Como hay ranchos que sí están buenos, pero... Hay un, hay un 60% que está bien, pero hay otro 40% que no está bien. Entonces, ¿cómo podemos eh, trabajar juntos verdad, para cambiar esto? Y, y los rancheros que están haciendo bien, pueden, deben de sentir la responsabilidad también de los otros rancheros que no lo están haciendo bien, ¿verdad? Esa es una realidad, porque yo voy, por ejemplo, parte de mi trabajo es ir rancho por rancho en diferentes partes del estado, y ahí es donde yo he visto trabajadores en viviendas arriba de los ranchos, eh, al lado de las vacas, de la maquinaria, entonces condiciones de vivienda que a veces que no son justas. Pues, entonces eso es lo que, lo que nosotros hemos logrado aprender y queremos cambiar esa realidad. Um, so, when I'm speaking, I'm speaking from my, my own experience. I've worked on four different dairy farms, uh, and, and so uh, I, I know um, what the conditions are that I'm talking about. And I have worked on some farms that have better conditions, like, like what you're describing, uh, but I've also worked on others where I uh, was working uh, seven days a week with no day off and being paid four dollars an hour, and that was in 2011. Um, so we, uh, in 2014, uh, we conducted a worker-to-worker -worker survey where we went around to uh, farms and talked with about 200 workers, and what we saw there is that uh, the average worker is, is working between 60 to 80 hours a week, 40% uh, of those with no day off, um, and 40% and of them are making less than the minimum wage, uh, and, and there are a lot more results from that survey, and you can find it on our website, uh, migrantjustice.net. Um, so there are farms that, that are providing relatively good conditions, and, and that's certainly the case, uh, but in the case of wages, for example, there, there are 40% that are not, that are providing less than the minimum that, wage. That just seems like a huge number to me, and 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 as far as 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 far as the the minimum wage goes, um, I can tell you that I don't know about the survey, but <coughs> housing is free in our farm. So a lot of these folks don't have any comprehension necessarily as to what the true cost of housing is. So we might pay, we might start at minimum wage. But the housing costs, like I, we've had gentlemen come to work for us from Wisconsin before. It's it's a very regional thing, which is interesting. You go much west of Ohio, it's expected that these guys find their own housing. So when you look at that, it's really two to three dollars more per hour because 
because the housing is part of that. So when, you know, I, I just, I don't believe at all the, the 40%. I, I just think that that number sounds way too high. Um, I'd love to go talk with the same farms that you talked with um, because I, I can tell you there's a shortage of people working on these farms. So, I mean, there's such a huge network. These guys can go, it's, it's free will. They can go wherever they want to go to work. Um, and, and we see it happen all the time. We'll have, we'll have a person come and maybe they, they have a relative that's at another farm and they desire to go to that other farm. And it, you know, you can understand that. So I, I just, your number sounds really high to me and I'm, I, I, I just don't see it. I mean, these folks would leave if, if we wouldn't be able to retain them. So hang, hang on to that point, because we'll, we'll come back to it. But uh, Doug, why don't you jump in? I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I didn't get to finish. Oh, okay, please. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, please. Just, look, please let the, the translation finish so that you can respond to what's being said. Sure. Um, so uh, where we were cut off was um, that uh, Kiko saying, so as we can see, there, there are some farms that, that are providing relatively good conditions, uh, but in the case of wages, 40% uh, uh, that are below the minimum wage. Um, and we think that the farmers who, who are doing right by their workers, uh, that's laudable, but, but they should be worried and, and should be uh, feeling responsibility for, for their colleagues who, who are not doing so. Uh, on the subject of housing, um, uh, you know, I, I go from farm to farm, uh, that, that's my job, and, uh, and I visit workers who are uh, living in the barn, uh, either uh, above the cows or, or next to uh, cows and machinery. Uh, the, these are conditions uh, in housing that, that we see in the state this day. Right, so, Doug, why don't you jump in at this point and talk a little bit about your, your project, because in some ways you stand between these. And so, yeah. So let me give you a little bit of background story about how I came to get to know Will and Walt Gladstone and Newmont Farm. Um, I reached out to Migrant Justice initially because I was aware of the work they were doing. I was aware of the fact that many dairies, uh, dairy farms, rely on the labor of Mexican, Central American workers. And so through speaking with uh, colleagues at Migrant Justice, I was told about um, a project that also takes place at Dartmouth College through the Geisel School of Medicine as a doctor who's been going out to the regularly over the past 15 years, um, who leads Geisel students in uh, providing uh, consultations for the farm workers. Okay. Who provides consultations for the farm workers, uh, medical care, which they don't, of course, have um, as people who are not here um, as uh, citizens of the country, uh, paying for insurance. So at any rate, um, I made contact with Will. Will was speaking at a, a medical school talk, and uh, after the presentation that Will was a part of, introduced myself and he invited me to get to know their operation there and uh, proposed from the very get-go that it would be a very beneficial uh, experience for his uh, farm workers to interact with some of the Dartmouth students, which is what my goal was to have Dartmouth students give them the opportunity of seeing what life is like on the farm. And I'm not too far from where they are on this campus, but not really having any interactions with the local farmers, the people who produce our food and our dairy products. And Will suggested that uh, teaching English would be a wonderful thing for the farm workers to have the opportunity to do. That the, the Dartmouth students um, could go to the farms and interact with the farm workers. And from the very beginning of my uh, visit to Newmont Farm and its subsequent visits to other farms, right in our area, I was impressed by the quality of, of housing and the um, respect that the farm owners have for their workers. You know, recognizing, as Will said, that it's they're essential to maintaining the operation. And so I felt uh, good and comfortable about having Dartmouth students go to Newmont Farm and other farms in our area and have these interactions and get to know what the farm workers' lives are like and what the farm owners' lives are like. And so the whole idea of getting the Dartmouth students out there, getting beyond the bubble, as it's often called, at Dartmouth College, and having some hopefully very productive, um, eye-opening experiences from both directions, I felt was a very valuable educational experience. And um, I do feel very um, you know, comfortable about how the farm workers are treated on, our, on these farms. Um, they obviously work very hard, they're working long hours, they're very far away from their families, they're sacrificing immensely to be here. 
um, and they're essential to the economy of our region. Um, and I think we've had some very productive conversations over the past few years that we've been running this program, and I look forward to many years more of having these, these partnerships, um, because I think everyone learns in both directions about the, the, the necessity of um, you know, recognizing the in indispensable labor that is provided to our agricultural system in this country. It relies very heavily upon uh, migrant workers, immigrants to this country. Um, so again, I want to just underscore that um, I've been very welcomed into this community. And from what I've observed over the years, I'm very impressed by the, the, the treatment of the workers at our local farms that there's, a, there's good work doing. Also recognizing that the work of migrant justice has been ins indispensable as well to help raise those conditions for a lot of farm workers. I think to your point, Will, I mean, I think if conditions were very poor, they're not going to stay there very long. So um, hopefully the, the bar is being raised all across the region to make the system better for the farm workers. Well, we'll get to questions. Um, but we have had some other people to hear from first. Uh, and but let me just follow up on um, you know, something that's kind of circulating uh, in this debate here. Do you see the work that you're doing from here in Dartmouth? actually is being quite important to keeping farm workers uh, working well uh, in good conditions on the farm. Is, is it a, a crucial piece of the, the puzzle? I like to think that it would be, um, you know, that we're providing an opportunity for the farm workers who, who live very isolated lives in many ways. As Will said, they can, they can get out to the supermarket generally once a week because they generally work six days a week, right? They are working very long hours. But I, I like to think that in the interactions that we've established, right, these connections with Dartmouth students, um, some of whom are the same age as the farm workers, that, you know, there's a mix of, of age ranges of the farm workers themselves. But um, I, I, I like to, I feel good myself about creating these connections, um, and I see the, the students who are in the class that I teach and my colleague Israel Reyes teaches um, as opening eyes and providing uh, insights into how other people live. Um, in some cases, for Dartmouth students too, their, their own personal histories might be pretty closely aligned with some of the experiences that the uh, farm workers are having as they are working here in the United States. Um, so, yeah, from an educational so, standpoint, I feel that there's a lot of good I'm, back and I'm, forth. I'm going assuming on. then that, that um, one of your starting points is also rooted in something that I think Will said, and I, and I know that Kike knows. Uh, which is that um, farm workers not only have, are, are skilled, right, but have a great deal of knowledge in what they're doing. And that knowledge is crucial. And that's one reason why turnover would be so harmful, right? Uh, it's the knowledge that they come with and it builds up in the time. And that's something, Tori, that you're quite interested in, I think, is the, the degrees of uh, farm worker knowledge and the way that that can be uh, developed use more productively without being exploited. So can you talk a bit about what your work has been? Sure. Yeah, and I don't want to abruptly transition, which I think is a really great conversation. I, we'll come back, don't worry. Yeah, but I did have a comment around it, because um, notwithstanding both sides of this, I mean, the right to organize is really important, and I think it's really essential from my experience in California. I think it creates tension, but I actually think it's about building the new vision for agriculture that we need. And it, it's also very tough for farmers, as we heard, that are not making a living off of this to actually carry that. So I guess what I wanted to say from my California experience is I think that organizing has really been key to create the expectation for demand to push the farm community where they can go, but would suggest, at least in California, I'm not saying we've solved problems, but I, I think we've brought in some interesting partnerships. So one, I would, I would suggest what Nico kind of alluded to is sort of, this is a market failure, right? We're demanding an agricultural system to carry all these things that are externalities that we're, that the system doesn't do. So corporate responsibility is really important. That's where we should go. But on the road to getting that, I think there's some interesting transitional opportunities, particularly there's a role for government. So in California, I would say we actually, on the housing side, just as an example, we actually have some fairly strong, robust programs in some regions that are really engaging government and helping build quality housing for not only farm workers on ranches and farms, but also for the communities that they've developed. And I would also say that the philanthropic community has also been engaged with that. I was involved in Marin County, where actually 
we couldn't figure out housing because of the economics and actually brought together the community to, to figure those things out. But we needed all those folks there, workers with their voice and strength institutionally, but also realizing the limitations of what farmers can do. So that's what I'm suggesting here is so there, there may be transitional um, structures that we need to put in place on the road to change in the economy. But for me, I think part of that, thinking about that investment on the farm side is to really to think about where we want agriculture to go. And so from my perspective, particularly from California, is um, you know, we're demanding more from farms. And we look at some of the work we're doing on climate. So we're, we're sort of up in the ante for agriculture to not just be economical, but we want to address all the sort of climate and environmental benefits and social benefits. And I mean, just from a really simple point of view, um, we're going to need a labor force like we've never seen to, to do all the things we want to do. And the economics is not driving that. So for me, looking at immigrant labor and the expertise is there, is not only the labor providing on farm, but for the restoration work we need to do on farm. So in California, we actually had 10 years ago a bill that was focused not only on on-farm restoration, but thinking about whole watersheds. So part of, I think, our conception of the investment needed for agriculture is that we actually need to see potentially these externalities we talked about, the environmental benefits particularly, as the investment potentially in communities that can start to address these problems to provide the economics for farmers in a real way. So having another product, but also looking at the value of farm workers, not just for the work they do on farm, but in the larger community for the work that we need to have done there. So that's that's part of our work is sort of seeing that new labor force, something that's going to be probably 10 times more than we saw during the Great Depression, where we mobilize folks on farm to do the work that we need to do. We don't have that. So for me, the, the workforce that's there, the skilled workforce, these people coming from farms that understand agroecosystems, there's actually, I think, a higher level of opportunity here if we are bold enough to come together and re-envision what we want in our communities and want for agriculture. So I'm not trying to be overly aspirational, but I think sometimes thinking bigger may allow us to have, to realign where we come together and to make a play for the investment that's going to be needed so everybody could advance together. So that, that's part of the work that we're trying to do in California. Slow and methodical. So then, uh, Kike, with your kinds of organizing, how important is, uh, is here for you? Many of the farm workers who come here uh, aspire to go home again, but many end up staying a very, very long time. So how do you think about um, the fact that many will end up staying here? Many uh, might make their full lives here. Uh, does this come into your organizing in any ways? Eh, bueno, eh, cambiando la, eh, la vida en Vermont, ¿verdad? Este, yo hablo de mi experiencia en Vermont, es como eh, transformando la industria, ¿verdad? Eh, realmente a un lugar de trabajo donde los trabajadores se sienten bien y se sienten en un lugar de trabajo digno, en un Vermont digno, en un país digno, eh, porque desgraciadamente estamos bajo opresión siempre de las leyes federales incluso estatales ¿no? y justicia migrante nosotros estamos tratando de cambiar esa realidad para que realmente seamos incluidos en, dentro de la comunidad que, no somos, que ya somos parte de la comunidad de Vermont de la comunidad de, 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 de trabajo agrícola entonces eh, esto, ganar la licencia de conducir cambiar políticas de la policía que no colabore con inmigración, que no inviertan sus recursos ahí. En Vermont ha traído un cambio significativo donde las familias se han querido quedar a, a seguir trabajando en agricultura y tener más oportunidades. Entonces, eso es parte de lo que nosotros como trabajadores buscamos, cambiar esa realidad en la que vivimos para realmente tener una vida digna aquí. 
Y bueno, hay, hay muchos que llegan con sueños, yo llegué con sueños, por ejemplo, de seguir estudiando, era una de mis metas, me vine a los 17 años de edad, ahora tengo 26, mi meta no era quedarme, ¿verdad? Eh, mi meta era regresar y poder estudiar la universidad, desgraciadamente ese camino para mí quedó truncado, eh, pero he aprendido mucho aquí eh, a través de las experiencias de cada persona, ¿no? yo me he transformado a través de las diferentes experiencias buenas y malas y eso me ha visto me ha hecho pensar en cómo podemos realmente tener una, una transformación digna, una vida digna donde todos somos incluidos y tratados bien. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think the work that we do is about uh, changing our lives uh, and transforming the industry to do so. Uh, so that we can create uh, not only a workplace that's dignified, uh, but also a state and a world that treats us with dignity. Uh, we all know that our community is under attack uh, from immigration laws, uh, and so we have to fight back against that uh, to be fully included in a state that we already consider ourselves a part of. So that work has taken different forms. It's meant uh, organizing to uh, pass a law allowing us to get driver's licenses, it's meant changes to policing policy in the state to allow us to live free from discrimination. Uh, and that changes things so that families can think about uh, wanting to put down roots and staying because they can envision life with more opportunities. Uh, so the work that we do is based on this idea that we can change the reality uh, of our lived conditions so that we can live dignified lives. Uh, many of us come with, with different dreams. Uh, and in my personal case, I came when I was 17. Uh, with the idea of uh, saving money so that I could uh, go back and continue my education. Uh, that was my goal. Uh, I'm, I'm 26 now and, and it hasn't uh, quite worked out like that. Uh, it hasn't been possible, but uh, I know that through what I'm doing here, uh, I'm learning uh, as well. Uh, and continuing my education through the, the good and the bad experiences that I've had um, and, and through my work to uh, make transformative changes so that we can live dignified lives uh, where we're included in the communities where we live. So what we have uh, on, on the table so far is it's kind of a conundrum. Right? On, on the one hand, um, economically, socially, environmentally, farm workers are absolutely necessary here. Right? On the other hand, legally, sometimes politically, quite often socially, they're unwanted. Right? So, uh, so this, is a, this is a central conundrum that farmers are dealing with, I think, and, and obviously workers are dealing with. And it's a question of visibility and invisibility that uh, Teresa started with, you know, the politics of visibility. And it really plays out on that map that has been shown a couple of times in the way that the uh, immigration authorities are able to police in this region and anywhere within 100 miles of, of a border, which in some ways maybe will um, uh, makes more complicated the sense that workers can easily move from one place to another, because it's dangerous to move. Right, uh, or it's 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 it's, uh, it's it's not quite so so easy to, to move as you might expect, and they, and they become in some ways uh, partially captive uh, on the farm because of the way policing operates. So how do we address that dilemma, right? That on the one hand, uh, immigrant farm workers are so needed, and on the other hand, they're often socially unwanted, right? What 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 are some of the ways in to address exactly that conundrum? Anyone who wants to jump in. I brought up something at the last Upper Valley Democrat meeting when uh, Mr. Trump wanted to send all the immigrants to Sanctuary City. So I'm from Lebanon. I wanted Lebanon, New Hampshire to become a sanctuary town. But then I said, how about a sanctuary state? And I think the Vermont workers could do the same thing. We're going to wait for a question. So I'm, I'm, I'm helping right now. Right now, not, not right now. Well, that's all I had to say. All right. Sanctuary states. All right, I, I, which is, all right, so there's, there's one thing. San, sanctuary city, sanctuary states. Right, um, and, and and to push back against the the, the regimes of policing Correct. that are at work here. What else? Let me go ahead. Well, I was, I was going to say just I mean my role as an educator here. I think you know that's one way to bridge these you know uh, the lack of awareness perhaps among some groups of people. Uh, you know with, I think of Dartmouth students that I teach here at this institution. 
institution, um, whether or not they'll go into you know advocacy work for immigrant populations, I don't know. But I, I, I hope that an awareness is raised amongst this generation of people who might potentially become the leaders who would make the policies politically, socially, that could shift where we're currently at, right, in this absurd conundrum of you know, immigration laws that are you know, excluding and forcing people to remain invisible when they're so completely essential to our agricultural system. Yeah, I'm going to add to, to what Doug says because I think what I'm also saying is not so, sort of an either or question, but a both and kind of question. And I think along with the, you know the importance of sort of opening up educational opportunities at a highly privileged elite institution, we also need to really think about how we understand narratives of people's lives in a much broader way. And I think what's interesting is we have actually very similar narratives coming from Will and Kike about you know the, the struggles and the lives and the realities that farm workers experience and I think that farm workers of course have that intimate knowledge from their own experience and farmers and farmers and employers also have that knowledge but I think that there's this work that we have to do to make visible these individuals as not criminals as not invaders as not rapists and I think that that's sort of a broader social project that is really really difficult when we're having a federal administration that's perpetuating those lies yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with everything you, everyone said. Um, I really think it's immigration reform. I mean, that's kind of what it needs to happen. Um, I mean, at our farm, um, we're in an area where we're far enough away from the border that we feel safe. Um, we, you know, these guys that that are closer to the border, it, it is a real issue. I mean, it's it's um, it's. And it's not because they they don't um, they, these folks very much would, would want their people to have as much liberty as possible. It's a safety thing, not only for the farm or for the for the people. I mean, because because there's just that that pressure of uh, of immigration at the border. Um, yeah, I mean, I, we very much want people to leave our farm and, and live normal lives like Doug had mentioned earlier. The question was posed, um, has Doug and, and his students made a difference? It's it's huge. I mean, these guys can go shopping, and but but being part of a community and feeling like, man, you know, this, I mean, we try to make them feel as much a part of our family and our community, but that goes so far. And um, being able to have them go out, Doug's taken them kayaking before, and you know that's just enjoyable. I mean, you can feel like you're you're having fun, and uh, it's so. Yeah, I think it's really you know awareness. I, I totally. Agree. So you say immigration reform is that a, a new guest worker program? Almost definitely, it's got to happen. And, and right now, H two A um, milking and dairy is is not part of that. That has got to be part of it. Most definitely. Historically, though, guest worker programs, at least in the United States, have been incredibly exploitative. Uh, as Californians on the on the panel know that from the history of the Bracero program, you know, in incredibly exploitative. exploitative, deeply exploitative of the workers who are there because they were easily deportable. Uh, uh, the way the contracting works, and so there would have to also be, I think, a, ref a reformation of what we understand guest worker programs and guest workers' sure. rights to be, and that would have to be a central part of it. All right, let me, let me see if uh, Kiko wants to jump in first, and then we will open it up for, for questions, because you guys are getting really anxious. Yeah. Yeah. Kiko, do you want to? Kike, sorry, Kike, do you want to? Sí, bueno, eh, sí, una reforma migratoria eh, sería un alivio, ¿verdad?, para, para la más de 11 millones que vivimos en este país en cuestiones de nuestras vidas eh, eso no cambiaría la realidad que hay en el lugar de trabajo eh, para mencionarlo nada más para eso se necesitan otro tipo de cosas eh, tener, hay trabajadores documentados eh, en los ranchos y, y, no, y son las mismas condiciones en, en algunos casos ¿no? solo para mencionar entonces eh, el programa de visas realmente no es algo que funcionaría si se expande a la, a la lechería porque eh, ahora estamos excluidos eh, 
porque eso, los que ya estamos aquí trabajando en los ranchos, eh, no, no podríamos aplicar. A, traerían gente nueva de otros países, el país que, que escoja, ¿verdad? Como nada más para seguir pensando en cómo hacer el trabajo. Eh, y eso es lo que hacen las leyes de inmigración, no piensan en la vida de cada una de las personas que ya estamos aquí. Entonces, eso pues eh, necesita algo más amplio, donde incluya a todos, no solo trabajadores agrícolas, sino trabajadores de hotel, de restaurante, de jardinería, de diferentes cosas, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, eso es lo que quería compartir. Um, so, of course, uh, immigration relief would provide, uh, immigration reform would provide huge relief for the uh, 11 million plus uh, people uh, living in this country without documents and, and provide a significant difference in our lives. Um, but at the same time, uh, immigration reform uh, alone uh, would not do enough to change the realities in, in our workplaces. Uh, we need to be talking about uh, other solutions as well. Uh, because there are documented workers who are working on dairy farms and experiencing the same conditions uh, that their undocumented co-workers experience. Um, the question about guest worker uh, visa expansion um, uh, wouldn't work for a number of reasons uh, on its own uh, because uh, simply expanding H-2A would displace the workers who are currently on the farm. It would have to be meeting a, a new workforce brought from uh, abroad uh, that would displace current workers. And we would ask ourselves the question then, of how are the farms going to continue uh, functioning if all of the current workers uh, are displaced? Uh, so when we think about immigration law, we really have to ground it uh, in, in uh, what it means for, for our lives uh, in real terms. Um, and, and so just to go back to the question of uh, immigration reform, when we talk about that, we aren't talking just about agricultural workers, uh, but it's all workers in, in all industries uh, who need permanent protection. Great. Nika. <laughs> <laughs> that the issue is framed in an immigration frame right now, but it's really, labor laws don't apply to agriculture. And that goes back to the end of slavery in this country, and that has never been addressed, that there is no equitable base for people working in, in agriculture as a sector in comparison to other industrial sectors. And as long as we don't address this, this problem will continue to exist. So yes, immigration reform is a bandage, bandage that will help but the fundamental change that we need to acknowledge is the societal services that agriculture provides as a sector are not being honored at all. Do you think it would help if the farm workers could join the UFW? Yeah, bro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Question way is back to the, well, pick one. <laughs> I really appreciate the panelists to talk about uh, the farmers and the farm workers being parts of the same system and seeing some optimism and collaboration. Uh, I do research in Vermont, so I can't speak to New Hampshire, um, but I just wanted to add a couple of things. One is a, there was a comment about the social environment in Vermont. Um, social support for farm workers has been increasing steadily over the last almost 10 years. So that there's actually in our communities, in our state, a lot of support for farm workers and people who believe that farm workers, uh, Latino farm workers, are adding positively to the state. As far as like wages, in 2018, we found a median of 10.50 an hour paid to Latino workers and a minimum of two additional dollars per hour for the benefits of non-wages like housing. Um, we also saw that a lot of evidence that farm, farm workers were able to move to farms that they uh, wanted to be on. So the majority of farm, farm workers, Latino farm workers, were happier on the farm they were on when we interviewed them than they were on the previous farm. All that said, it's a complex situation. Dairy is under tremendous stress. We did find in 2018, 11% uh, of farm workers who were extremely stressed by their housing and about uh, another quarter, 25%, who were at least moderately stressed. And you want to put that in the context of a dairy, a dairy industry that is stressed, where dairy farmers are going out of business uh, right and left, or you know, hemorrhaging farms. And I, I just wanted to kind of bring it back to 
um, Milk with Dignity, which is an effort, I think, to move some funds down the supply chain to farmers to hope that hopefully help them improve wages and uh, assist housing. I think it'd be an interesting thing to hear today how Milk with Dignity is what what they what has been learned over the last year of Milk with Dignity to improve and strengthen. Do you want to address the last part of that? Is that... Sí, bueno, eh, sí, Leche con Dignidad fue un triunfo importantísimo para, para la comunidad de, de trabajadores en Vermont. Eh, un primer paso, eh, como decimos, que firmamos con Ben Jerry's. Eh, y eso fue un camino difícil, no, no fue nada fácil cambiar eso. Entonces el programa eh, incluye, como dije, los estándares para los trabajadores, incluye eh, educación para los trabajadores para que sepan sus derechos y cómo defenderlos, incluye un tercer partido que es un grupo independiente de justicia migrante que se encarga de, eh, de ser un recurso más ¿verdad? para monitorear eh, y hacer cumplir la, los, los derechos que, que hay bajo el programa y es un recurso para los, para los rancheros y para los trabajadores y para los rancheros eh, y el, 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 el incentivo económico verdad que viene desde las empresas también dentro de eso viene un incentivo económico desde la empresa al trabajador verdad entonces y ese bono que viene a los rancheros es para mejorar las condiciones y el contrato legal con, con Ben Jerry's verdad con la compañía que firmamos entonces ese es el programa quería mencionarlo para que que son los cinco elementos esenciales del programa para hacer un cambio, porque programas existen muchos, y, pero cuando no hay cómo realmente monitorear, hacer cumplir, pues, y si los trabajadores no saben sus derechos, no, nada pasa, todo queda en papel, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, después de que firmamos, eh, ah, el primer año fue el año pasado, han habido cambios importantes, trabajadores que han aumentado su salario, eh, me gustó escuchar eso de que el 2010 fue un promedio de 10.50 porque esto tiene un efecto dominó, ¿verdad? Como los ranchos que están bajo el programa eh, ya están mejorando las condiciones eh, a través del programa y los rancheros al lado, pues para que los trabajadores no se van ahí, tienen que mejorar las condiciones también. Entonces, eso es parte de lo que quería mencionar también, pero... Entonces sí, trabajadores aumentando su salario, eh, teniendo día de descanso, trabajadores que llevaban tres años sin tener un, un día de descanso, como lo han logrado, eh, hemos visto que unos trabajadores ahora tienen una casa nueva, entonces el incentivo ayudó al ranchero a poder lograr esto, entonces fue, fue parte eh, y sigue, ¿verdad? Poco a poco este es el segundo año que estamos haciendo el programa y pues está realmente trayendo cambio y dándole voz a los trabajadores en su lugar de trabajo eh, eh, y también en cuestiones de salud y seguridad la industria lechera es muy peligrosa para todos los que están ahí hay animales grandes, hay químicos, hay maquinaria pesada entonces eh, bajo el programa incluye esto también para haber protección para, lo, para los que trabajan ahí y, y ha mejorado, ¿verdad? Y que los trabajadores también pueden hacer recomendaciones eh, que les dé, porque tienen el derecho, pero a veces el, el, el lenguaje, ¿verdad? De, de las barreras de idioma, pues eh, juega un papel importante, entonces el programa facilita en eso un, una cosa. Y al final del día, el programa, ¿verdad?, busca eso, como crear un ambiente de trabajo, un lugar de trabajo donde nadie se quiere ir, donde realmente tienen condiciones de vivienda, salario, trato y horarios justos. Entonces, eso busca el programa y crear mejor comunicación entre el equipo de trabajo, rancheros y trabajadores. Um, so yeah, Milk with Dignity has been an incredibly uh, important victory uh, for, for farm workers in Vermont. Uh, and the first step, as we said, was signing this agreement with Ben and & Jerry's. And I should mention that that, that was no easy road. Uh, that took a lot of effort. Um, but uh, now that it's signed, um, the program has been implemented. And I'll mention briefly the sort of five elements that hold this program together. 
Uh, it includes a code of conduct that has labor and housing standards that have been defined by workers for workers. Uh, it includes uh, paid education on the farm uh, so workers can learn what those rights are and learn how to defend them. Uh, it includes an independent third party monitor, an organization that's independent of migrant justice, uh, that's a resource to monitor and enforce the rights that are guaranteed under the program. Uh, and that's a resource that exists for both workers and farmers to support them in achieving uh, those standards. Uh, there's an economic incentive uh, that we talked about. Uh, this is um, uh, something that's paid from the company uh, to the farm and the farm worker uh, to help offset those costs that are needed to improve conditions. And the fifth element is that this is all held together uh, by a legal, uh, legally binding contract between uh, the organization and the company. So that's how the program works. Um, and so uh, uh, this, this is really important to understand because there are a lot of uh, programs and initiatives out there, uh, but if you don't have education, uh, if you don't have enforcement, if workers don't know what their rights are and have a way to enforce them, uh, those standards are, are, are just, they just exist on, on paper. Um, and so after Ben and Jerry's signature, uh, we have seen really impactful changes. Uh, and it was good to hear about uh, the, the, the raises in wages and, and uh, we're seeing this sort of domino effect uh, on farms because on the farms that are in the program that are now given uh, wage raises, uh, the neighboring farms as well are seeing that they have to uh, provide raises as well. Uh, and so it's having, um, it's having a, a larger impact. Uh, but in addition to uh, uh, raises, uh, we're seeing other impacts as well. Uh, things like workers who have been working for years and years without ever having uh, had a day off are now having a guaranteed day off per week. Workers who have uh, uh, been living in uh, difficult housing conditions have now had new houses built on the farm. And those changes are being paid for uh, by this premium paid for by the company. Uh, so we're seeing uh, lots of uh, positive uh, impacts from the program, and we're now entering into the second year. Um, oh, that's a uh, whole another page here. Yeah, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, so in addition to the material impacts, um, let's see how many more here. Uh, uh, it, it's about, uh, it's deeper than that. It's about uh, giving workers a, a voice in the workplace. And we're seeing that particularly in the implementation of the health and safety standards. Um, we know that dairy is a very dangerous industry. Workers are daily working with uh, large animals, with chemicals, with heavy machinery. And so some of the things that the program does is uh, it provides prote uh, uh, personal protective equipment for all workers, and then it also creates a space for workers to be able to communicate uh, uh, and uh, offer recommendations about improvements uh, to reduce risks on the farm. Um, and, and so that's a right, uh, but then also uh, in order to, to overcome the, the, the linguistic or the, the language barriers uh, that often prevent that sort of essential communication from happening, the program provides support from that. So at the end of the day, uh, this is about creating a work environment where workers don't want to leave, uh, where their salary, uh, their hours, and their treatment is dignified, and where it creates an environment of mutual respect between workers and employers. All right, I, uh, I have two questions from uh, out there in the Twitter land somewhere uh, that are quite closely related, I think, so I'll ask both of them, uh, and then we'll go back to the, the live audience. Uh, so how can we ensure that migrant rights, benefits, and dignity are achieved with the pressures of automation and oversupply in the dairy market to force farmers to close or to barely break even? That's the first one. And then the second one, Tori Estrada. We haven't heard enough from you. Uh, important to remember that tensions around farm worker rights reflect larger market failures in the current food system. Wonder if hope for change just requires more farmers to get seriously critical about capitalism. <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that until you think about it. Um, I guess one thing I would suggest, I mean, again, I don't work in Vermont or Northeast currently, but from the California experience, I think one of the conversations we're having, um, in addition to the milk and dignity agreements, is the concept of a just transition. 
So it's something that's been framed in the environmental justice community as a you know, just transition for oil and gas, but to think about what, first, what's the vision about the agricultural change you want to see for both farm workers and farmers, but this idea that, uh, particularly on the farmer side, there needs to be a just transition to that, um, that these changes in some ways, for some particularly small, medium-sized farmers, particularly in our state, will require an investment in the transition. So why I think, you know, this is a really interesting dialogue, I feel like, it's creating the opportunity for us to have this in a higher level conversation about what is our vision for agriculture and how do we create a process to take both farm worker, farm labor, and farmers that are willing to do that through that transition. And I, and I do, I will say, I think there is a predominant role for local government to play some of that role and a responsibility to connect that back to consumers. Um, not only the price they're willing to pay, but also the politics of the, at least, you know, I'm from California, so we're in this very progressive state, but we are now having these conversations at the urban level about connecting to food and about the, not only rights of labor, but the, the importance of labor. But what's being lost in that is, is sort of the challenge around farming. Um, so I think these new frameworks around just transition are really important, but they're gonna require that we connect the dots between folks that are managing land, labor on the land, what policy folks particularly to figure out what those transitions are and have an investment either for that transition. So I, I don't think we have the answers for that, but there is a, a process that California is going through right now to challenge itself to do that. And it's a lot of tension, um, but it, I think it's the pathway we need to start to walk. I think it's absolutely uh, vital for all of us in this room to be listening to everything that's being said in this panel as if we were sitting on the earlier morning panel, right? It's the kinds of, of challenges and uh, suggestions and different kinds of moves, alternatives, that are being uh, experimented with implicate labor at every step of the way, right? Some of the farmers own labor, sometimes hired labor, and so forth. And so thinking about both of these together, right, which is challenging, I think is, is vital uh, in this. So there's a question here, yes. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, so, uh, I have a question. I think, I think what's interesting, what I've heard, is that there's like this big thinking done in the sort of theoretical university level space, which is really important about, you know, um, combating capitalism, which is, which is huge. Um, and, and I think there's also the onus on people who are struggling to make ends meet, like the farmer in Fairley, which is also real. Um, and I'm wondering if we could also talk about the growing, still small, but the growing community of wealthy-ish, owning class type young farmers who are buying farmland in Vermont, who may be coming from cities and have decided to try their hand at agriculture, um, which is great, and also probably constitute a large part of the percentage of organic agriculture in this state which is still, considering the state is pretty progressive, is still pretty small. Um, and so my question, and then, so then, comma, there's also a program in Vermont where the state is paying $10,000 for people to move here because it's so underpopulated, um, which seems like a lot of money, and I've actually known a few people in our town, um, in Berkshire, who have moved <laughs> because of that. Um, so, I, so one of my questions is these young farmers predominantly white, who are saying, oh, like, what's my niche? You know, how am I going to kind of enter into this agricultural world that makes sense for me? What if there, and, and then there are a lot of people who have, um, who are the older homesteaders from the Backs of the Land movement who, you know, ran small farms and no longer do it and have all these, like, unused hay fields and land that's just sort of sitting there. And I think Airbnb has been at something where people are like, oh, that's something that I can dabble in. But um, what about some kind of worker owner? And this is for Kike and Justicia Migrante. Like, is there a worker owner collaborative that could be created where the workers choose the method of production on privately owned land and connect with private landowners? So this could be unused hay fields or whatever, you know, milk production, gardening, pigs you know, hemp, whatever, 
And could something like Dirt Capital from the first panel and or a legal representative support this land collective um, where it would be more about subsistence farmer, farming for the workers as opposed to these more conventional, you know, um, not conventional, but market farms who are already struggling to, to make a profit. I know it's complicated. Sí, eh, yo creo que en la comunidad de este, eh, migrante en Vermont eh, habrá muchos, eh, conozco algunos que quisieran tener su propia finca, su propio rancho y manejarlo, entonces todo esto, y creo que ese es hacia una transición justa, porque realmente eh, no podemos siempre, eh, sí, el capitalismo es... es un problema más grande, ¿verdad?, que no lo vamos a cambiar como algunos, sino eso realmente necesita haber un cambio de, de, en el mundo, porque el mundo ya es capitalista. Entonces eso creo que es uno de los caminos que llevaría a, hacia, esa, hacia, hacia la, esa transición justa, ¿verdad?, donde todos podemos, tenemos los mismos derechos, tenemos las mismas oportunidades sin ser excluidos. Entonces, eso sería algo que puedo comentar y como dije, sé que en mi comunidad habrá muchos interesados en, en, en algo así. So yeah, I mean, I, I think in, in uh, the immigrant community, I, I know a lot of folks who, who have that dream of, of owning their own farm, um, uh, who would like to, to uh, own land and run their own farm, uh, and, and, and that's an, a concept of, of a just transition, right? Uh, because we know that capitalism uh, is a problem, uh, but not a problem that's going to be changed by just a few actions. It, it requires a global change because it's a global system. Uh, but this is a path uh, towards a just transition, uh, an opportunity to, or a, um, a path to, to uh, have the same rights and the same opportunities without the exclusions that we see right now. Um, so it, it's something that we're interested in. Teresa, would you like to address that a little bit from your research? Because you've You've looked at uh, efforts to uh, support gardening and farming and so forth by farm workers in Vermont. Yeah, I can talk really briefly. So I help coordinate um, a program through UVM Extension called Worthless, which is a, a small, very small scale, very seasonally dependent um, food security project that attempts to um, open up more localized and culturally appropriate um, sources of food. And we've worked on as many as 50 dairy farms um, but for a fairly low funded organization, that was way too many. Um, we currently work on about 30 dairy farms, mostly in Franklin County, because that's where we see most of the food insecurity issues being um, really significant. And I think it points to a couple of things. Um, things that um, Tori brought up is that oftentimes farm workers are really underemployed, sort of under their skill. And a number of workers are coming with really rich agricultural experiences and knowledge of permaculture and knowledge of agroecology, but that isn't necessarily where they're being paid in the food system. And so, um, you know, there's a number of really interesting and exciting opportunities for farm worker to farm owner transition, but that's a really difficult thing to think about in dairy, um, where dairy requires a huge amount of capital up front, um, a huge amount of space up front, um, and as we've seen, it's not the most lucrative of businesses. And so we're seeing some, you know, some really exciting um, movements around sort of opening up, um, you know, small-scale diversified farming operations for farm workers who, you know, have that access, but dairy is a very different beast. Um, I've definitely heard um, from a number of individuals who lived and worked in Vermont about their desire to go back home and become sort of small-scale diversified farmers when they return and using the land that they've been purchasing and using the homes that they've been building. Um, and that's another interesting question, is sort of what happens when people go back home, because that is often what people are really wanting to do. Um, so, yeah. Doug, what about you from your experiences? Well, we're going to do the garden project for the first time. Franchising. Yeah, exactly, franchising out at New Long Farms. So we're looking forward to that pro process. It, I mean, there have been gardens in the past that have been put, planted at, at New Long Farm in years past. Um, again, I think, uh, back to education, I think for uh, the students who are going to be helped planting those first gardens this year, um, they'll be modeling you know, 
and what can happen in future years um, as the franchise expands to other farms in our area. Um, and again, through the, the goodwill and support of the farm owners, I think we can do some interesting things. Um, yeah, some, I don't know everyone's stories of the farm workers that I've been meeting over the past few years. Um, I know some of them. Some of them do come from agricultural backgrounds and, and maybe have that dream, that plan for the future um, for themselves when they return to, to Mexico. Um, some people come from very different backgrounds too. Uh, so I think, you know, agricultural independence, I mean, this is the main focus of the conference, isn't it, that we need to really address these big issues that, you know, not many people actually think about. So um, again, back to my role as a, a teacher here at Dartmouth College, I think it's really important that the young people who I'm interacting with and in my classes that I teach here gain that awareness and hopefully an appreciation for the, the crucial importance of uh, agricultural production and, and who's doing the work um, and the difficulties that, that farmers face as they're trying to survive in a very difficult climate that, that doesn't recognize you know, the, the essential nature We've got another question from the audience, but first, um, Doug, you just said that, Will, you were um, uh, encouraging gardening on your farm before these kinds of projects. What got you going on that? Um, well, I, a lot of the, you know, we like growing gardens. They like growing <laughs> gardens. There's land everywhere, so um, <laughs> I can remember, you know, it really depends on the people. And like Doug said, there's um, there's a lot of folks that have agricultural backgrounds. There's a lot of people that don't. I mean, it really depends on the area of where they come from. Um, and it's amazing. You can definitely tell. You know, I can remember my dad probably three years ago. We tilled up this land back in one guy's house, and there was a lot of weeds that grew. So you could tell he was not, not much of a gardener. So it, it you know, I, I think that. The guys that enjoy to do it, which we always give the space available, Doug's going to make it a little more fun, I think, with bringing students in and, and making it more of a team effort. Um, but yeah, no, these guys really do, a lot of them do enjoy gardening and uh, no, for sure. I, I think the, the, the fact of like talking about agricultural independence, I think the big thing is is just independence period. I, I don't know as it's gotta be so complex as as all as everyone wants to go run a farm or you know grow hemp or, or whatever it might be. These folks just wanna be part of our communities, feel welcome, um, and be treated really well. And 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 we do our darndest at our farm to do that, but but there is somewhat of a stig stigmatism. You know, you go to Hannaford's and there's that radical person who might like Trump that thinks that they've got to take actions into their own hands. That that's more of the you know raising the veil. I think as far as hey, these folks are part of our community, whether we whether we like it or not. Um, that's kind of what I think. Um, I can tell you some of our guys have, have have gone back. I can think of one individual really well. He was from Veta Cruz. He went back and started a lemon orchard. Um, so, so there definitely is some of that for sure. Um, yep. Thank you very much for this hour of time. It's been super valuable, and my head will spin with the thoughts for this for weeks. I'm sure. So I really appreciate the panel. Appreciate the debate that happened at the beginning. I don't want to put any farmers in jeopardy, but I have this question between Fox News and CNN, what reality is. On the undocumented labor force, are taxes being paid? So FICA, income tax? Most definitely. And, and so are also, so then that, so you're able to then afford that labor pool at a minimum wage with taxes on it, and then the in-kind taxes as well. Housing is an in-kind wage to be taxed. So the dairies can afford that? Because it was my understanding that they, they couldn't. And so that was a question of mine. And I just, I just didn't know if that in general happens. I also do believe that it will take a change in the food system of us actually paying a far greater share of our 
um, wages for food or corporations paying in order for farms to afford that. And, and so the, the, the last question that I had on that, oh, also with respect to H-2A, that's a tough wage to afford. In New Hampshire, the minimum you have to pay is $13.25 per hour, plus you also have to pay housing. And the housing also has to meet OSHA standards and get inspected and so on and so forth. Plus it's the cost to actually transport from country of origin to the uh, farm. So that, that is a, an obstacle, but I agree immigration reform is, is part of it. And then I was wondering, with all these ideas of um, visibility and, and social justice, which I um, absolutely support, how does that happen in our society if people are not if people are not recognized as being here legally? So if you're not here legally, how do you gain that visibility? How do you farm someone else's private land? Um, don't you have to hide? Um, and so, what what are what are the options if we don't tackle that first? Oh, I, I just said that to Doug privately. I just said, you know, hey, before, the, I mean, it's a wonderful idea to have these folks own land, but really the big thing is, is, is having good documentation. I totally agree with what you just said. Um, you said a lot, so I'm, I'm trying to remember the question. Is that you? Um, Can you afford um, to pass anything? Um, can, can we? Yes, but we, we, we milk 1,400 cows, and, and it really has nothing to do with capitalism. It's a necessity. Um, if you look at the attrition rate and how large the farms are that, are that are going out of business, we have to continue to grow to drive down our fixed costs. It's just like running this hotel, right? They have to figure out how to cut their budget every year because their fixed costs continue to grow up. To go up, so um, I don't think it's. I think the bigger thing is is the consumers, like you just said, figuring out a way. Hey, people want want the land to be open in Versailles, Vermont, or Fairly, Vermont. How can we pay somewhat of a premium to have that happen? Is is the wage affordable for most people? No, not not with what we're getting paid currently. Looks like this year is going to be a better milk price year. Um, in in most farms in Vermont, their average cost of production to produce a hundred pounds of milk is somewhere around nineteen dollars and fifty cents to twenty dollars per hundred pounds. We've been getting paid anywhere from sixteen to seventeen dollars. So there, the answer is no. There's not enough money. Um, as far as the H-2A workers, we do grow 100 or 200 acres of wholesale pumpkins. We've had such a difficult time finding temporary workers in the fall. My dad could speak way better to this than I could. But from September 1st to October 20th, we need about 15 to 16 people to harvest our pumpkins. We've had such a difficult time that we just recently got two homes approved for H-2A housing. Yeah, it was very difficult, but there again, it's a necessity. We can't, we can't do it without them. So, yeah. Anyone else from the panel want to jump in? Question then, and I think this will be our last question. Sorry to say. I'm sorry to tell you this isn't a question, just a, be our last comment. <laughs> just a statement. Um, no, it's 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 a it's a great uh, um, symposium event that you put together here and and uh, I really appreciate um, you know the immigrant justice um, sitting at the table and, and the gentleman from California and and my son, uh, you know, at some point, everyone that's at that table is making a difference. And I think what happens sometimes when they talk about, you know, my son got <clears throat> his hair a little bit on end on a percentage at one point in time. And I don't know what the percentage is, no more than he necessarily knows. But the fact of the matter is, if the immigrant justice wasn't at the table, some of these issues that are out there wouldn't be getting better. 
there's no doubt there's some farmers, you know, it's funny we talk so much of this about business. The fact of the matter is the two most important people, aside from my, in making us to where we've been today, is my dad and my grandmother, and it was all about how we treat people. So some of this that we do, we do just because it's the right thing to do. And if it's the right thing to do, it probably is going to help our business. But the big ones that I can see with this whole uh, debate, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. There's got to be enough revenue generated to make enough profit to make all these other things happen. But from the immigration standpoint, you know, uh, you know, sometimes some battles seem so big, like at the farm, you, you just go and do your job and, and, and you hope someone else is going to solve that immigration problem. But that needs to be solved because so much of this, you're talking about milk and dignity. I mean, the fact of the matter is the guys that care about their health, because that's the backbone of our operation, um, we need these guys. And we don't want them to not live the same lives that we're living. And, and to be out there in the public and, and be present. So, I mean, you know, the immigration, I'm glad we're sitting here because hopefully we can go out of here and, you know, um, I don't want to talk politics. We see it all the time. We talk about the wall. But I am so amazed, I'm going to contradict myself, I'm so <laughs> amazed at a time when we're so worried about a wall that that is not the moment in time that we don't get some compromise to figure out immigration at the same time. I can't figure that out. But I don't think a lot about it, trust me. <laughs> but I appreciate what everyone's doing here to try to make a difference. Thank you. So I, I think what we've seen on this panel uh, is um, the that everyone here is living in a squeeze, right? Uh, there's there's the, the pressures of competition, the pressures of get big or get out, uh, the, the, the set capital costs, the labor costs, and all the difficulties of those. There's the ability to live with a decent wage and to live with decent work, which uh, can, can be contradictory to those other pressures at the same time. Uh, and each one of them, I think, is a struggle and also a problem that has to be confronted from these different perspectives. And what I found most valuable in listening to this is um, that I don't think the debate that started actually ever ended. It was still going on only in other terms. And I think that those were very, very productive terms for thinking about what that struggle should look like from different perspectives, from the perspectives of workers and from the perspectives of farmers and those who seek to work with, uh, with both in, in, in different ways. And so I found this myself very rewarding. I hope you have. I want to thank all of the panel members, and maybe especially Will uh, Lembeck for his translating. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone.